الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. One of the remarkable places on the surface of the earth is that place which gets the title and honor of being called a masjid. Now, whenever we think of a masjid, we think of the walls, the ceiling, the roof, and everything. We think that is the masjid. The masjid is actually the ground. The actual ground is the masjid. The physical ground, the mud, the, the soil, that is the masjid. This just then becomes a means to protect from the wind, protect from the rain. Otherwise, a masjid is just the ground itself. We know, for example, that when Masjid Nabi was first built, in front was only the trees, uh, day palm trees. There was no wall there. So the walls were built afterwards. So with that understanding that it is this piece of land, we know, and I said this is a remarkable <coughs> piece of land on the surface of the earth, is that when we enter into the masjid, then it is the one place where we could just sit there and we get reward for. So whenever we walk in, we should say, Nawai tuli atikaf ma dum to fil masjid. That I make the near to be in atikaf for as long as I stay in the masjid. This is obviously what's referred to as the Nafal Etikaf. The Sunnah Etikaf is the one, inshallah, if those of you are chosen, will spend the last 10 days or 9 days in seclusion, like the way the Prophet ﷺ would spend in the cave of Hira, in seclusion, in order to really truly connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disconnect from the world. So when we come to the masjid, and it includes those parts behind us, and includes around because when we are in the honor of the masjid we know that this is the shari masjid that has been dedicated to it but also people use the back room the other hall in order to recite the quran so we need to make sure that when we are in the masjid or around the masjid that we respect the honor and the sanctity of the masjid unfortunately that's one of the things which we've noticed over the time is that the sanctity <coughs> of the masjid has gone Whenever I used to take back in the day uh, non-Muslims to come to a masjid, they would literally tip door at the back and they wouldn't even talk to each other and they would just sit there and then they would tip door back out and only mention talking outside. Similarly, when Ofsted inspectors would come in and we would have the students praying in the hall, they would tip door around and go into the room. So it's amazing how non-Muslims have that respect for the sanctity of our masjid and we have lost that sanctity. So as I was driving in, I parked up, a brother asked me, that, please, whilst you're giving your lecture, can you remind the youngsters in the back who are playing around, joking and messing about, I'm trying to recite the Quran and it's putting me off. Well, it's, it's not right though, is it, that people who come to the masjid in order to connect with Allah and then they have these grievances. So we need to make sure you know, there's many of us that if we see somebody, a quiet word, obviously young people, we were all young ones, remember? We're a bit wild. We can be a little bit, you know, off the track. So a quiet word in the ear, brother, you know, Jazakuna khair for coming to the masjid, may Allah reward you. Do you know that while you're in the masjid, you get all this reward? Lakin, you know, show some respect to the sanctity of the masjid. There's a brother reciting the Quran there. There's a brother who's trying to pray his nawafil there. Well, he won't be praying his nawafil now. <coughs> who is praying his qadha. <coughs> So at least respect the other users of the masjid so that when you lose the honor of what we call the sha'ir of Islam, what we call the symbols of Islam, once you lose the honor for the symbols of Islam, then that's already a sign that Iman is escaping from your heart. These are what we call the sanctity and the symbols of Islam. There was a time way back where even though we were all off the beaten track, when we see a brother with a beard or when we go near the masjid, we adopt humility and humbleness. Slowly you're starting to see even that now coming out of the clutches of our ummah with that respect and that honor that used to be for the masjid and those what we consider as the symbols of Islam is slowly going. So we need to take heed. But remember there is always hikmah that should be applied. You know, I know we're all puhtana and we only know one way and that's the only way we know. But there's got to be a smart, wise discussion. What we don't want to do also is put off our youngsters from coming to the masjid. So I just, uh, that was not my intention to discuss that today, uh, but as the brother mentioned it to me, I just felt it was uh, appropriate to, to raise it at this point. 
Babu Sabr is what I wanted to talk to you about. Sabr is a very, very <coughs> difficult practice. It is a practice in which the Anbiya والسلام, were trained to be shepherds in order to develop sabr. Even our Prophet Muhammad والسلام, was a shepherd. Now can you imagine one of the greatest humans that ever walked on the surface of the earth and his day job was to look after sheep. We would think that sort of belittles him. You know, why is a man of such a stature, why is a man of such a nature looking after animals? This is something that we would give to the youngest amongst us that by you look after those sheep, come back, bring them back in the end of the day. But the reason why these tasks were given to the Anbiya is to develop patience. People say patience is when you do nothing. Wrong. Patience is when you do something. If, for example, now somebody gives me bad mouth, or somebody gets funny with me, or somebody has blocked my car in when I go out, <coughs> my immediate reaction is to get angry. That's my immediate reaction. I do that without thinking. That's automatic. So getting angry is easy. Anybody can get angry. Usually you find that the weakest of people get angry first because they can't do anything else. So the only way they can express something is anger, so they lose their temper. A person who is sabr is the one who is actually containing that volcano, containing that fire and subduing it. That is harder. <coughs> and when people say sabr is, I'm not actually doing anything when I'm patient, you are. The patience is that you are able to control your emotions, control your anger at a time when it's easily to be provoked. That is exercising sabr. That shows you are actually active and not passive. That is not a sign of weakness, that this is actually a sign of strength. <coughs> Imam Nawawi, as you're getting used to now, he brings the uh, narrations, he brings the ayats of the Quran first, as we have seen in other areas, in other two chapters that I've discussed with you so far. قال الله تعالى الله سبحانه وتعالى says يا أيها الذين آمنوا صبروا وصابروا or those of you who believe be patient and enjoy patience that not only should you exercise patience <coughs> you should also encourage one another to be patient one of the things we also unfortunately a weakness we have is we're not happy with Allah's timetable we're saying, Allah, you, you got it wrong. That's what we're saying, really. This brother has done injustice to me. What kind of world is this? Surely right now, I want the azab of Allah to come down on this person. This person is going around talking about me, saying things about me, even though they are all lies. We can't wait till Yom al -Qiyama. We want our matters to be sorted right now, immediately. In other words, what we're saying is, Oh Allah, this is what we're saying, that you are my khadim. Do as I command you. That's what we're saying. If you want something to happen, you're saying to Allah, why haven't you sorted this out? Why isn't this being sorted out? This person has badmouthed me. This person has come and slapped me in the face. I've not done anything wrong to this guy. Sort it out. Sort it out. When Allah SWT has already said to you that it will go according to my timetable as I wish, when I wish. For you is to remain patient and put tawakkul in me, trust in me. Have faith in me. That's what Iman is, to have faith. So Allah SWT himself is saying, have faith in me. Believe in me. <coughs> trust in me. But when we take matters into our own hand, then what we're saying is, we don't have faith in you. We don't put our trust in you. We feel we need to take our own steps. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, Ya you wa ladina amanu, isbiru wa sabiru. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa kum bi shay'in min al khawf, wal ju, wa naqsim min al amwal, wal anf, wa thamarat. And wa la nablu wanna kum. Here, for those of us who studied Arabic, we can see that the lam which comes before nabluwa is for emphasis. In Urdu, we say lam li taqeed. The noon which is coming is noon muthaqqala. Yani it's got tanween on it. Wanna. This also comes for taqi, for emphasis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, in English he's saying, that absolutely, with certainty, with no doubt, clear your ears out. If you think you've got any doubt about this, I'm telling you, I have no doubt. 
I am telling you with certainty, what am I going to do? I am, we are going to test you. If you think maybe, nah, no maybe. 110%. We are going to test you. The tests are going to come upon you. This is an Elan. That you are going to be tested. How are you going to be tested? Min al khawf. You're going to be frightened. You're going to be frightened either of an enemy. You're going to be frightened due to something else. But there will be fear in your heart. Also, well, due hunger. You will be tested in hunger. Now for us, obviously, we are the 20% in the world. We live in a house. We have warm heating. We have enough food in the fridge and freezer to survive for the whole of Ramadan. Our ladies, mashallah, have already made the samosas ready in the freezer. They just need frying. All this is ready for us. We've got drinks, all types of drinks. In fact, we're running out of space in our kitchen. We now have to store it in our basement. Forget roof in our basement. Now even the poor child that we put in the attic, he's now having to share space with food. We're saying food, son, son, food. Get to know each other. You're going to be spending a lot of time together. And that's the 20%. The 80%. <coughs> put your TV on. Search your internet. Your Syrian brothers and sisters. Your Palestinian brothers and sisters. Your brothers and sisters from Rohingya. Your brothers and sisters from every corner on this earth forget having food. They don't even have a roof over their head. You are the 20%. You are the very fortunate 20%. So we are tested in hunger. That is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know I say that you know when you have a coin and you flip a coin, on one side is heads, on the other side is tails. Sabr and shukr are on the opposite side <coughs> of a coin. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you, you do sabr. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to you, you do shukr. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to you, you do shukr. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes something away from you, you do sabr. You are either doing one or the other. If you are doing neither, then wait for musibah to come your way. Wait for trials and tests which you cannot bear. We are so fortunate that we do not need to bear the trials and tests that our brothers and sisters are bearing on the other side of the earth. We get a little bit of headache, a little bit of pain. You know, we're already talking Islamophobia, Islamophobia, we're scared. Oh, what's what this happens? What if that happens? Subhanallah. This is Bradistan for crying out loud. Even the government needs permission from us before they come here. <laughs> what are we afraid of? What are we frightened of? But bringing Bradistan, should it not be the best city in the UK? Is it the best city in the UK? We are Muslims, we say we're the best Ummah, the chosen ones. We're the elite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of all the people, the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Mushriks, the Kufar, selected the Muslims. Have a look at our streets. You tell me what's going on in our streets. These are our streets. I don't see, you know, I remember when we were growing up, we had to deal with the NF and ointment and things like that way back in the day. <coughs> the city actually had a football team that used to play all right. I don't know which division they are in now. But when the fans used to come, we used to get the hassle. We used to get the trouble. So we could say, oh, you know, this because of this reason or the other reason. These are our streets. Our relatives. People we know. And what is the situation? Shouldn't it be that Bradford should be a model for every single city in the UK? So people say, why is it that people in Bradford are like the way they are? Let's go find out. Like the way they found out in Medina, when they came to Medina, they said, what is this place? What do you people believe in? What do you people do? They pointed to the Prophet ﷺ. They went to the Prophet ﷺ. He told them, we don't lie to anybody. We don't deceive anybody. There's a narration which mentions that when the Prophet and his army had come to a fort and they were going to attack this fort <coughs> and there's a shepherd looking after some sheep. So he comes up to the Prophet and he asks him, who are you? And he explains who he is. He says, oh, I've heard of you. I want to accept Islam. And we will take these sheep as our booty, as ghanima. 
The Prophet ﷺ said to him, fine, I will accept your Islam, but we cannot take this because when you took this from your owner, you took it with amana. You need to return it back to your owner with amana. Is that, is that how we do it? When we're selling our car, we clean it up, get rid of all the oil stains off the engine. We say, brother, this car, I saw it, nothing wrong with it. And he's selling it to our own Muslim brother. And then we're going to think, Allah is going to be happy with us. Allah is going to bless us. He's going to enter into Jannah. Bayi, look at me, Kalimada. Yeah, if it was that easy, wouldn't the Munafiqun also be going into Jannah? If it was that easy just to say one word. These are realities and these are things we have to wake up. Also, reduction in your wealth. Zakat time comes. We're finding excuses not to give zakat. Yeah, you know, I've got that debt, haven't I? And, and it's also, you know, it's hard nowadays. And, you know, so many excuses. Monana Sahib will stand up. Say, Bhai, Masjid ke liye kuch do. You know, help with this project, help with that project. Oh, you know, I've got to look after myself. Look after yourself, alhamdulillah. We just mentioned, your house is improving year by year. Your new furniture comes in. You're getting redecorated. Your house is getting bigger. Extensions are getting built. When are you going to be satisfied? At what point are you going to say, enough? At what point are you going to say, you know what, I think I'm doing all right now. I've got a 16 bedroom, there's only two people in the house. I've got more food to last me for the full year. But the problem is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be patient. He'll wait. And when the time comes, we are the ones who will suffer. Well, unforeseen, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes souls. He gives life and he takes life. And that is one of the hardest times. It mentions that a lady was crying at a grave in a narration and the Prophet Islam walks past the grave and he said, Isbiri, be patient. So she goes, what do you know what I'm going through? Afterwards, somebody mentions to her, do you know who you addressed? So she goes, I don't know who I addressed. She goes, you addressed the Prophet Islam. So she realized. So she asked, where can I go see him? They pointed in the direction. He went, but again, this shows the nature of the Prophet Islam. You know, nowadays, you know, everybody, we want everybody to know was that you know, don't call me just, you know, this or that, the other. Call me by my title, brother. You know, I'm something, I'm somebody. I'm Haji Sahib, I'm Khan Sahib. This woman did not even know this was a Prophet of Islam. Look at the humility and the humbleness. She didn't even know who he was. Later when she goes, she goes, I will be patient. The Prophet of Islam said, no, not now. In the Sadmat al-Ula, when the impact takes place at that time, that's when you'll be patient. When the news gets broken to you that your wife is dead. When the news gets broken to you that this has happened to your son. When the news gets broken to you that your business has gone corrupt. At that time you say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And you be patient. Because you know this is Allah's will. To be impatient is to challenge Allah's will. To challenge Allah's plan. Now you got this wrong Allah. This is not what I want. You made a mistake. You should have taken somebody else's wife. You should have taken somebody else's son. Why have you taken mine for this is Allah SWT saying, وَلَا نَبْلُ وَنَّكُمْ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوْ وَنَقْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Thamarat here is specifically referring to fruit, but it means in terms of your job. One day you got a job, you're earning good money, and then you get sad. Okay, you get sad. So you start complaining. You know, I pray five times a day. I've got a beard. What have I got sad for? That guy doesn't even pray five times a day. This brother lies. He's got a job, he's got a job. It's like the only way you can survive in this world is when you do wrong. You know, look at these words we're saying. Who are we saying this to? Who is listening to this? Who is the ultimate power? And then how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finish this ayah? Wa bashiri sabiri. They give glad tidings to those who are patient. What are the glad tidings? That you will get better than this in the hereafter. This is only 60, 70 years tops, max. 80 years, if, if you're lucky. You know, how many of our grandparents are still alive? They've gone. Well, for some of you, they're not because you're young, but when you're old like me, you know, they're gone. Some fathers have already passed away. Some people's brothers and sisters have passed away. And some of the unfortunate that their children have already passed away. The point is, how long is this life anyway? And in this life, it is trial after trial after test. Imagine if this life you never fell ill. Imagine if in this life you were handsome. I'm not saying that some of you are. 
Imagine in this life if your wife was the best looking, most attractive, intelligent woman on the planet. Imagine you had all the... Somebody nearly breaking his fast there. Imagine. <laughs> imagine. Okay. Imagine you had all the money in the world. Imagine your house was the best. But we don't have any of those things and we still want to hold on to the dunya. Imagine you had them. Yeah, we don't have any of them five. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to let go of the dunya. We have hope of dunya in our hearts. The love of the dunya. And yet we don't have any of them. I said, Illa mashallah. There might be a brother sat here saying, you know, speak about yourself. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. Apart from him. So therefore, why is it? Why can't we look forward to this life where Allah SWT has, himself has promised you that you will have gardens and meadows as far as your eye can see? When Allah SWT himself and his Prophet alayhi salatu has promised you with the best of partners, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because you're all fasting. And he's promised you wealth beyond your imagination. We know that the last person who comes out of Jahannam, the last person, it's a long story, and I, you know, I'm conscious of time. When the last person who comes out of Jahannam, and I'll mention, well, I'll mention it anyway now that I start it. So when he gets taken out of Jahannam, he's outside of Jahannam, so he says to the Prophet, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I'm going to only ask you one thing, I'm not going to ask you anything else. Turn my face away from Jahannam. I've been in Jahannam, I've been burnt in Jahannam, I want to turn away. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will say to Allah, I won't ask you anything else after this. I'm paraphrasing. I won't ask you anything else after this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns his face away from Jahannam. After some time, you know, human nature. After some time, he says, Ya Allah, just move me a little bit further away. So Allah said to him, you just said that you just wanted, not just this last thing, but I wallahi, my eyes stick a needle in my, whatever it is. So he says, all right, fair enough. So he moves him a little bit further away. And this, I, I normally carry this on for about 20 minutes, but I'm not going to today. Because, you know, I don't know if you've got the patience. You see the way I did that? So, yeah? So once... He then eventually says, Oh Allah, take me close to Jannah. This is like the fourth time or something. So he brings him close to Jannah. After this, I'll never ask you again, cross your eye, you know, put a needle in my eye, cross my heart, put my knee. No, I'm going to ask you again. Eventually, when he gets to Jannah, he'll say, Oh Allah, bring me close to the gate so I can look inside. <laughs> say, you know, what did you say? You said, I'm not going to ask anything. Again. No, no, just this last thing. Just let me just look inside and we'll ask you again. So again, you know, cross my heart, stick a needle, whatever. Brings him close. And he's now looking inside and he's seeing people laughing and giggling and enjoying themselves and drinking. Because remember, you can drink in there. The drink in there is one which doesn't intoxicate you, but it gives you the buzz of your life. Right? Halal. Nothing is haram there. Halal. <coughs> okay? You go. So he's looking inside. Everybody's having a party. Okay? And he wants a piece of the action. He wants a piece of that pie. So he says, Oh, one last thing. <laughs> Let me go inside. <laughs> he said, You've asked. You're not going to do it. Eventually, when he says, Tamanni, when he, the, the hadith mentions, he says, Wish. So he wishes. He says, Wish. And he wishes. And he says, Wish. And he wishes. And he says, In one hand, narration, he says he gets twice that. In another nation, he says he gets ten times that. <laughs> this is the last person out of Jan. And we can't wait for that. <laughs> hey? We live in, live in a broken down house with you know minimum earnings, driving a Black cash guy. Yeah? In hard times, and we want to hold on to this. And we want to exchange this for Jannah. For eternal bliss. It's madness if you think about it. Waqala ta'ala Allah subhanahu says, Innama yu wafa sabiruna ajirun bi ghayri hisa. Indeed, those who are patient will get their ajr in full without reckoning. You know, when you're rich, I don't know how it feels, but when you're rich and you want to pay somebody, you don't sort of count it out like, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20. There you go. You just say, hey, bro, do you want any more? Here you go. Do you want any more? Here you go. You don't count it because you're loaded, you're minted, you've got a safe behind you, you've got so much money, you don't need to count it out to this person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, your Rabb, the, the same being that created you, the same being that gave you eyes, that gave you life, that put you on this planet, is promising you that he will give to you your ajr bi ghayri hisab. Without hisab. Wa qala ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa laman sabra wa ghafra inna dhalika lamin azmil umur. This is a surah shura. This ayat mentions it. It's beautiful. 
for that person who stays patient and he forgives, for indeed that is the most difficult things to do. <coughs> we've all got family. Yeah, we've all got family and then we feel like one of our family members does it does it dirty on us basically. Yeah, how does that feel? How does it hurt? It gets right to the heart. It affects us. You want to break that tie. You want to tell them where to go. You have nothing to do with them. It's easy to do that. But the harder part is to forgive them and be patient. That is incredibly difficult. This is why being patient is not being passive. Being patient takes a lot of hemma, takes a lot of ability to do. Otherwise, everybody will be able to do it. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Istainu bi sabri wa salah, inna Allah ma asabirin." That seek help by patience. If you do something, <coughs> if you do something, then don't expect Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to do anything. If there's a story that our Asatiza used to say that there was a buzurik, and this buzurik <coughs> used to walk with his murids, and he used to go to the masjid, and there was a chap who used to sit there, and he used to hate ulama, so he used to hate on him. He used to say, "Oh, look at this guy. He thinks he's some sort of top shot." You think about them, yeah, yeah. And he used to just give him gali and abusive words. I'm not going to give the swears. He used to swear at him. And the murid used to get all psyched up like, Ustaji, just let me knock this guy out. And he says, no, leave him, yeah. What's he doing to you? No, Ustaji is dissing him. Doesn't matter. Chore, go, let's go. And he used to go to the masjid every day. Giving him gali every day. One day as he's going, he's still giving him gali. The Ustaz says, why won't come out? Hit him quickly. This guy's got a little bit shocked. Like, wait a minute, we've been going past this guy every single day. He's been giving the same gali. Why today? <coughs> so this one hesitates. He goes, kill us now. At that time, a bolt of lightning came from the sky and struck him. He said, because I have been patient, I've left my trust into Allah. Allah will deal with my enemies. But when I knew, I was, was, I was informed of what was about to happen. I thought, if I take my badla in the dunya, he says, as I won't come. Allah won't step in. Because I give, I've retaliated. I give in return. There's another narration in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Al qatilu wal maqtulu finnaar. The killer and the killed is in Jahannam. So the companions are surprised. Okay, we understand why the killer is going to Jahannam, because he's killing. Why is the one who's killed going to Jahannam? What's he done? It was because he had the near to also kill. He had the near to also kill. We know from Habil and Kabil when his brother comes to attack him, what does he do? He puts his hands. He says, do what you need to do, brother. I'm not going to say anything to you. And his brother killed him. So even this, this is patience. It may look like defeatist. It may look like this is strange. But this is patience. This is what is always expected. Because Allah SWT is saying, actually seek help. Istainu, Seek help through patience. And salah. So we finish that one. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَلَا نَبْلُوا دَتَ جَكَلَ رَاشِ مَنَا وَبُرْخَا رَاشَ سِكَيْشِ نَسَ دُو وَبُكُرِي مُكُرِي بَسْ وَبُكُرِي تِكِي وَبَسْ بُكُرُ رَاسْتِي وَلَا نَبْلُوا وَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمَ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ And indeed we will test you without any shadow of doubt Again وَلَا نَبْلُوا وَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى until we know the mujahideen and the sabirin those who are in a position, those amongst our Muslim countries that have the power and the strength then obviously they should raise the sword they are the mujahideen but those that aren't, they have to stay patient under the aggression. So we're seeing now across the earth, whether it be in places in India and other places, where our Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters are constantly under attack. Just because of their faith, just because of their dress code. But they're not in a position to stand up. If they did, they would be annihilated. So this is the test, like our Sahaba went through in Makkah. The abuse that they went through in Makkah, the attack. Look how patient the Prophet ﷺ was. Did at one stage the Prophet ﷺ raise his hands and say, Well, Allah, why? The Prophet ﷺ buried his two sons with his own hands before they reached Buluh. The Prophet ﷺ, his mother passed away, his father passed away before he even saw him. He was a yatim, raised as an orphan. Even his daughter passed away. His two daughters got divorced as soon as he declared Islam to the mushrikeen because they were married to his uncle, uncle's sons. So he divorced him immediately. How does it feel when you're a father and your daughter comes back after she's been divorced from her husband? It's not an easy thing to take for a father. The Prophet <coughs> took that as well. And never once did he raise his hands. Instead, he started making dua to Allah. He started to praise Allah. He started to do zikr to Allah. He's saying, Allah, you are the greatest. <coughs> Imagine that. Would any man here be able to take a tenth of that? No chance. No chance. 
Not once did anything come out of his mouth. We hear, for example, about Ayub alayhi salatu wasalam, where Ayub alayhi salatu wasalam was testing one test after another, after another, after another, until it's mentioned that his body completely deteriorated. <coughs> completely deteriorated. And he never raised his hands. It's only when the illness was reaching his tongue did he raise his hands and say, Oh Allah, I have not raised my hands up until this point because I'm patient and I accept your plan. But if this disease reaches my tongue, I will not be able to do your zikr. That's patience. Every Nabi you see exercise patience. Nuh for 950 years, he declared Islam. 950 years, his own wife was planning against it. Lut his own wife planned against it. Pharaoh's wife, Asiya, she was tortured to death by her own husband because she accepted Islam. All these stories, and there are many, obviously I'm conscious of time, there are many, you could sit here for hours and hours and hours explaining all these individuals who exercised patience because they understood what that meant. Imam Nawawi himself says, and the verses with regards to encouraging and enjoining patience and explaining its excellence are many unknown. Obviously, many unknown amongst the ulama. Wa akhru da'wana. And alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.